Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to move north and look at Venice. And Venice is an interesting city for a number of reasons. One, it is the capital of a part of Italy called Veneto, where a distinguished architect emerged named Andrea Palladio, whom we'll talk about at length in a moment. But we're going to begin by talking about Venice, because Venice in itself is a pretty interesting town. Venice is up here, up here, tucked in really to the area at the top of the Adriatic. And historically, it has had no connections with Rome, unlike so many of these other towns that we've looked at, like Florence and Milan and Rome, for that matter, that were Roman settlements and have this kind of detritus of Roman architecture and this history of, of Roman planning and Roman civilization. Venice, Venice has none of that. Venice is a marshy fishing village, historically. Surrounding it, on, on various edges, we have the town of Ravenna down here, which was a great Byzantine capital. And to the north, we had the town of Aquileia, another Byzantine capital. But Venice was nothing. Venice was absolutely historically nothing until the great moment when they launched the crusade to bring back the body of St. Mark and to establish a prominent church around the relic of, of St. Mark's body. And therefore, the town grew to prominence. But as you can see from this map, Venice is really in an awkward geographical situation. It is this marshy land. It's an island. It's not collect connected to the mainland. And really what you see here is artificial ground. There is a tiny little piece of high ground right over here. And a bridge was connected between these points of high ground. Riva Alta means high ground or high banks. And the Rialto Bridge jumps between those two little banks. And historically, let me say, until the, until the 18th century, that was the only bridge in Venice. And the general belief was, well, why would you want to go to the other side of the Grand Canal? What, what purpose could there be? If you need to buy potatoes, you can get them on our side of the Grand Canal. If you need to buy fabric, you can buy it on our side of the Grand Canal. So the city was historically divided into really tight neighborhoods. And the charm of Venice is that it still is. I don't know if any of you guys have ever gone to Venice as tourists. And if you have, you either are going to love it or hate it. And you're going to hate it if you're on the road that says to Piazza San Marco or to train station or to Rialto. But if you get off that road, the charm of Venice is that it is such a tangled mess that nobody ventures out there. And then you find these wonderful little neighborhoods with uh, little squares with, with cisterns and little cafes, and it's, and it's great, is all that I can say. I love Venice. But it is easy to get lost in Venice, because it is this tangle. And, and notice it's, it's also not gridded. It can't be gridded. It's just a mess. The fabric of Venice comes from water collecting, rather than any kind of gridded strategy. Because it's out in the middle of salt water, they would have to collect rainwater. If you look at this plan, you see all of these little squares, all these little piazzas. And each piazza would have an underground cistern. So that when it would rain, water would collect, and that became the water source. The charming uh, sponginess of the city fabric is really a practical convenience. And it's amusing because for many years, dogs were illegal in Venice. Because if you were going to collect your rainwater from the pavement, you didn't want dogs there for obvious reasons, because of what dogs do. Dogs are awful. But here's a good tip. If you get lost in Venice, <laughs> do what I do. Go like this and say, oh, well, the train station's here. <laughs> St. Mark's is here. Uh, the uh, Santa Maria de la Salute is here. And then you can figure out where you are, and you can navigate. This is uh, Adam from the Sistine Chapel showing us how to make a map out of our hands of Venice. Another thing about Venice is its particular geography gave way to a particular style of painting and style of architecture. Its geography and its history, let's say. This is an example. This is Giovanni Bellini's Pietà. Fabulous painting. We see here a painting that's not so different in its compositional strategy from the Vatican Pietà by Michelangelo. This triangular woman holding her, her uh, dead child. But here, Bellini is not using the Michelangelo's diminution of the, of the size of the Christ. It's a, a large adult male. But some things we can see that are quite different in Venetian painting with respect to the paintings we've seen before is just the idea of where this is taking place. This is taking place in an incredibly detailed, incredibly specific landscape. Specific in terms of its geography, specific in terms of the variability of the architecture, specific in terms of how space 
and plant life are rendered in this landscape. And this is, this is what you see in Venetian painting. You see this attention to natural detail. And in fact, those of you in the room who have a computer, and I'm thinking that means everybody in the room, probably know that you can format things uh, portrait or landscape. And Venetian paintings, for the most, most part, are formatted landscape, so that they get this broad horizontal sweep of the earth. I think it's instructive to look at the same subject matter handled at roughly the same time by a Florentine painter, Botticelli, and Bellini. And you can see what I mean about this, this idea about the horizontal, the idea about the landscape, and the idea about specificity in the observation of nature. Landscape in Florentine painting, for, the lar for, the, for a large part, tends to be generalized. This lump represents a rock. This thing represents a tree. But here you could get botanists in, and they would name every plant. There's another difference going on here, too. And that has to do with the medium that they're using. The artist Botticelli is using something called egg tempera, which is really what they used in the Middle Ages. It's, a, it's an opaque medium. You grind up your pigment, and you have to find something sticky so that it will stick to the surface of the panel or the canvas or whatever. An egg, egg yolk, is the sticky thing. Uh, if you don't wash your dishes frequently, you will notice that egg yolk is incredibly sticky, and painters notice that. So this is really just sitting on top of the panel. There is a, a kind of opacity. The colors are incredibly brilliant. The colors are incredibly deep because they're so, they're clo so close to the surface. But the surface itself is a flat thing. There's no, there's no pictorial luminosity within the surface. And in the case of the Bellini, there's a completely different technique going on, and that is oil paint. Uh, and you think, oil paint? I know all about oil paint. But you don't. You don't know anything. Oil, 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 oil painting came to Venice through this Sicilian guy called Antonello da Messina, who learned from northern artists. The northern artists up in you know, Flemish country were, were already doing oil painting. And, and the technique was to do these <coughs> monochromatic paintings like these. These are incomplete oil paintings. And then to glaze them with transparent washes. So to get something like Bellini's Pietà here, there would be a kind of reddish brown and white monochromatic underpainting with maybe 30 layers of glaze. And the effect of that is you get this incredibly deep, incredibly luminous surface. Many people say that the idea about light or this love of light in Venetian painting comes from the fact that in Venice you're getting two kinds of light. You're getting light coming down from the sky, but you're also getting light bounced up off the water. So there is a, a strange light that this, this technique of painting captures very effectively. If you go to a museum and you have a chance to get a look at a Venetian painting, go close enough to get to see how this surface works. It's absolutely worth you know, getting a few inches away and getting tasered by the guard, because you will have had a great uh, aesthetic experience up until that moment of horror. Here's just another Bellini painting, and I'm just showing this to you to give you another example of, of how landscape becomes a participant in the idea of the composition, and not just as a neutral background where action takes place, but really as an equivalent player in the drama. This is St. Francis in the wilderness, and the wilderness is full of life. Here's his mule, who seems to be as engaged in this apparition of the, of the burning cross as St. Francis himself. And that's kind of a nice nod to St. Francis's acknowledgement that animals have, have stature. This is, this is widely considered to be one of the oddest paintings in the world. This is The Tempest, La Tempesta, by Giorgione. Giorgione is slightly younger than Bellini. What's the subject here, you might ask? And nobody knows. This is really one of the big enigmas. It seems like it almost might be one of the first examples of a pure landscape painting, where the subject matter goes away. Over here, we can say, well, it's all about St. Francis. Or we, we could say, it's all about the Pietà. And, and those are acceptable subjects for a painting. Those are religious themes. You would have patrons that would pay for that. But what's the subject of this? You know, you have this hunkering down naked lady, kind of not posed very elegantly, crouched like an animal, suckling her child. And then you have a soldier over here. You know, what is the relationship between these people? Usually when you see a mother and child, it is the virgin and child. This cannot be the virgin. The virgin is chaste. The virgin is pure. The virgin sits in a ladylike fashion. This is a naked, hunkering, almost animal woman in this wild, uh, undomesticated landscape. 
So something's happening. And maybe it's some kind of confrontation between what it is to be in a natural state and what it is to be in a cultured state. We have here architecture. And here we have just nature. And the architecture that we have is also kind of odd. It's, it's broken architecture. We see two little columns. Hard to know what they are. They could represent the, the overturning of the pagan civilization. You often see broken columns meaning that. Or it simply could be a landscape. It's really hard to know. Even the attitude toward the sky and weather becomes really specific in Giorgione. This is a storm. This is a tempest. He's not simply painting the sky as a background against which we see his protagonist. The sky is an active participant in whatever this enigmatic drama might be. Fabulous. And again, it's worth getting close to these paintings. Because if, if you thought the Bellini surfaces were interesting, the Giorgione surfaces are even thinner. It's, it's like there's barely any paint on the canvas. His washes are so transparent. You can see the grains of the linen coming through. And there's such a disruption between the scale of reading the grain of the linen and this kind of incredibly deep space that you marvel. Here's one more Giorgione. And I think this Giorgione explains to us a little something about Venice in a way that's instructive. This is a painting called The Three Philosophers. It's sometimes also called The Three Ages of Man. It's in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in, in Vienna. Who are these three philosophers, you might be inclined to ask? And I think their costumes tell us something about who they are. This guy, wearing his toga or his, his robes, seems to represent classical philosophy. And he's an old, old man, because classical philosophy took place in antiquity. And so the fact that the aged man, whose, whose heyday has come and gone, represents the classics is pretty interesting. Then over here, we have this middle-aged man wearing a turban who could represent Islamic philosophy, the, the knowledge of the Middle East, which was much sought by the Florentines, but readily available to the Venetians, because the Venetians had such strong ties with the East that they never stopped trading with Eastern countries. They never stopped having a strong population of, of people from, from Turkey and, and, and the entire Middle East as just part of the people that, that lived in their country. And Islamic philosophy would be things like mathematics and science and things that, that went to a high level of sophistication during the very period that, that Europe went into its thousand years of darkness. And the young man we have over here could represent Neoplatonism or, or the Renaissance spirit, the contemporary moment, looking out toward the future. It's as, the, as if these two have contracted into the thoughts that they've already thought and this young man representing the present, not looking to books, but looking to nature, is beginning to develop a new sensibility appropriate to the new age. Fabulous. I just want to show you what kind of stuff was being done in Venice during the Quattrocento, when Florence was launching its Renaissance. And this is probably the most celebrated example of Quattrocento architecture, the anonymous Ca d'Oro, which means golden house. Boy, is it good, is all that I can say. And things that, things that make it so good are the extremely refined level of craft and all the carving and all, and all of the detail on it, but also the way in which this ornament and this kind of pattern is arranged. Because Venice is so mushy, because Venice has no really solid ground, you build foundations by driving piles, wooden timbers, perpendicular into the ground. And so the, the structure of the bearing walls is perpendicular to the canal. And the benefit of having bearing walls perpendicular to the canal is that the front facade of the building has no structural responsibility. It can just be hung there. So it's incredibly dematerialized. The bottom part is open to the canal, so people can arrive by gondola. And the top part is equally open with these porches and loggias. And a thing that is sort of amazing about the way the facade works is that it constantly re reorganizes itself. At one moment, you might think, well, this is the center. And then suddenly you find pairings over here. Well, this is the center. And then you find pairings over here. So the, the facade doesn't stabilize itself in a kind of ABA system the way a Roman or a Florentine facade would. But it, it dances and sparkles and renegotiates its organization all over the place. This, of course, is St. Mark's that we looked at before when we talked about Byzantine architecture, Gentile Bellini's painting of the procession of the True Cross. And I just want to show you this because I think it's interesting to see how this takes 
the spatial nature of the quincunx of, of St. Mark's domes and flattens it out. And by looking at the way he's painted this, you can see how these domes and the image of the domes, these rounded arches on the front, seem to make the front facade of St. Mark's almost look like an orthographic projection of the space of St. Mark's. And by orthographic pr projection, I simply mean all the information is projected onto one plane. It's all flattened onto one plane. You find in Quattrocento Venetian architecture, people taking these themes that are already established in the older works, like St. Mark's, and, and elaborating them even further. This is the Scuola Grande di San Marco, the school of St. Mark's. And a school is something like a lodge or a rotary club or a fraternity, whatever you might want to call it. It's a service organization of, of gentlemen of Venice. And there are a number of these different lodges. And so this one is presently the hospital in Venice. So if you fall ill in Venice, look for a beautiful building with pigeons flying through it, and they'll take care of you there. It's a kind of funny looking thing. It's funny looking in the same way that the Cadoro was funny looking. And by that I mean, insists upon a center only to subvert that center. For example, here we have this tripartite organization that organizes itself around the central portal. That seems fine, but we then have a kind of doubling of that gesture right over here. Double, 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 fine. This is the Scuola Grande di San Marco. These are people faithful to the Church of St. Mark. That is the church that sponsors this charitable organization. And so the flattening of the domes here, the flattening of these half circles, in some way reprises the basic organization of San Marco. The point that I want to make is that it, it seems to be referring to the church that it represents, San Marco, by having this cornice of, of rounded arches that seem to be presenting, like the facade of St. Mark's itself, the deep perspectival space of St. Mark's. And this idea of orthographic projection, or three-dimensional information being collapsed onto a two-dimensional surface is also happening in other ways. I'm going to show you a detail of this lower area down here, which you probably can't see very well. And this is what it looks like. It looks like fake perspective, that there has been this uh, bas-relief, panelized representation of deep perspectival space flattened on the building, which already looks like an ortho orthographic projection of a domed quincunx space. So clever, you want to say. This is another Venetian church, Quattrocento Venetian church, by another one of the great Venetians. And I think this is really beautiful also. Mauro Colucci. And all the Venetians have their names spelled in two different ways. One is the Venetian spelling, one is the Italian spelling. So you'll never keep them straight. But what I think is so nice about this is it more or less picks up this dematerialized language that we saw in the Cadoro and that you get by having your foundations done in this very specific directional way. And it uses it to sort out the problem of the basilica facade. Like how do you create a facade that allows you to represent light coming in at the upper story, clearer story, but still creates a facade for the whole building. And in many ways, Coducci here is doing something that we'll see Palladio doing in stronger classical terms when we look at the Palladio churches in a, in a moment. And that is, he's superimposing two figures. Little guy, which is round arched temple, and big guy, which is round arched temple. He's not doing it in a very classical way. His method of articulation tends, for the most part, to be stacking. There's not so much that's a large figure organizing the whole thing, but it, it's pretty interesting. Some details of Coducci's language. A bit classical, because he knows the Renaissance is going on. And one reason he knows that the Renaissance is going on is that Venice is the publishing capital. Every treatise that got published on architecture during the Renaissance got published in Venice. He also knows the Renaissance is going on because at roughly this period, the Medici were driven out of Florence because they were always in trouble. They were always gouging people for money. They were always usurping more power than they should have. So Cosimo de' Medici and his entire court of Florentines came and set up shop in, in Venice for a few years. And they built a library at the monastic community of San Giorgio Maggiore. And the minute Cosimo, in beautiful Renaissance style, and the minute uh, Cosimo left, they tore it down. They just hated having this Florentine thing in the city. And this Florentine thing, in many ways, is this Roman thing, this thing that seemed out of place this is my favorite Venetian church, Santa Maria dei Miracoli. 
Pietro Lombardo is my favorite Venetian architect. And this is really a spectacular building, this one. Santa Maria dei Miracoli. This was a, a votive church built to celebrate the end of a plague. They basically said, oh virgin, please intercede, end the plague, and we will build you a church. St. Mary of the Miracles. The plague ended and they built a church. You see it on the site and it looks almost like a boat floating along a canal, which is an appropriate image for a building in Venice, this great city of shipbuilding, this great arsenal city, this great port from which the Crusades launched many a voyage. And here it is, more or less, in the district of Canareggio, right in through here, at the very edge of Canareggio, as it approaches the Rialto Bridge. It's the most beautiful church in Venice. I will fight anyone who argues otherwise. Even in plan, it almost looks ship-like. It's this long thing perched between two different canals. And the vault, the barrel vault, was constructed by the carpenters of the Arsenale, the same men who built the hulls of the many ships that sailed in the Mediterranean Sea. If you look at this thing, it's an ambiguous reading that you get. In one sense, you see clear geometry, kind of a square, kind of half a circle, clearly a circle, classical orders. But the dominance of pattern, the incrustation of surface texture and ornament undermines any sense of classical gravitas, any, undermines any sense of gravity for that matter. And instead you see something that is more akin to the Byzantine architecture of Ravenna or Aquileia than anything that you might see in Rome. Lombardo is playing with material, polychromatic marble encrusted together to create this incredibly rich surface that is somewhat decked out in classical articulation, but somewhat giving you the sense of that mosaic encrusted surface that we saw in Byzantine architecture, which is quite nearby in the town of Ravenna. These kinds of devices are of interest, I think. What we see here in these circles are columns, frequently spoils, treasures taken away from a vanquished city that have been sliced to make little round medallions. So this becomes a way of showing off the prominence of Venice, the treasures that Venice has con conquered, and also in adding another color and another texture to this wonderful mosaic pattern created out of varied marbles. Fabulous, you have to say. Here's a good detail of a little green cipollina marble and a red marble and so forth. I think an interesting thing about the facade and the whole way that the building sits in the city is its double reading. We see here from plan that it has two faces. One face that's all about facade and creating some kind of order and another facade that contracts to relate to the apse, the squared off apse in the back. As it relates to the squared off apse, spaces contract and you get this funny sort of sliding over of one device to another. Here's what I mean about the sliding over. This window centers on the interior architectural space, but slides inward and displaces itself with respect to the exterior. One reading is that it's kind of squint-eyed, cross-eyed, funny-looking. But another reading is that it is perspectival in the same way that the trompe arches of the Scuola Grande di San Marco were perspectival. He's also playing with this collapse of perspective, perspectival space onto the facade and into the interior. Here we see how this funny little building sits on the site, canals whooshing by on both sides, and this is the squint-eyed facade that we just admired a moment ago. When you go into the church, here is probably the best example of conquinquitas, that, that Vitruvian desire, that interior respect the ambitions of the exterior. It's like a lantern when you go inside, because there's this thin cut marble that lets light come in, and it's, it's, you, you see the entire expression of the volume of this church, and it's really beautiful. Also notice these rounded vaults aren't simply a style idea that the Venetians are using, but they also have to do with the fact that Venice is this great maritime city. Venice, Venice had this arsenal that could produce giant ships faster than any other ar arsenal. Thousands of ships a year were produced in Venice. And the same people who built the ships, the same carpenters who built the ships, the underbodies of the ships, built the roofs. So when you walk inside one of these Venetian churches, it's like looking inside a ship. You see all the timbers and it's really beautiful.
magnificent. And you also have the word nave to speak about the central part of the church. And it's, it's interesting that, that naval architects and naval carpenters build the naves of the Venetian churches. These are just examples of some of the treatises that are being published in Venice during this period. Sebastiano Serlio's uh, Seven Books on Architecture and more of it, and Vignola's uh, Rules of the Five Orders. And this is the town that Palladio is more or less associated with. And when I say more or less associated with Venice, he's from Veneto. And Veneto is the solid land, the terra firma, right next to Venice. So you have Venice, this island mush, and then you have the farmlands and the estates and the agricultural terrains held by the wealthy Venetians that are called the terra firma. And so he's from there, near Vicenza. As a young boy, he was discovered to be prodigious in his skill at mathematics and his skill in drawing, and he was taken in under the wing of a nobleman and taught the classics. And kind of similar story to Michelangelo's relationship with the Medici family, where Michelangelo was discovered to be a particularly talented boy and given this extra instruction, or Giotto, for that matter, discovered by Cimabue, given special instruction. His patron is this guy called Trissino, who is a great classicist and who takes Palladio to places like Rome, where he can look directly at the Roman ruins and sketch them and study them. And all of this results not only in a great body of built architectural work, but in a treatise, the four books on architecture, that Palladio wrote. Palladio is probably best known for his villas. Uh, and what makes the villas so great is that we have a collection of variations on a theme. Villa is kind of a standard building type. What villa means basically is country house. We've spoken about palazzo, and palazzo means large urban house, and villa means large country house. This is a sketch that Palladio did where he is more or less rehearsing variations on the theme of villa. And so what kinds of things is he, is he thinking about? Well, one thing he's certainly thinking about is the idea of geometry, the idea of proportion. And, and Palladio is good enough at math and late enough in the history of architecture that he's thinking about complex geometries like harmonic proportions. You know, how can these things be tuned to have the most sophisticated relationship possible? He's also thinking about decorum. Like, what is the appropriate expression for a country house? And this is, a, this is a tough question, because we saw people looking at palazzos and thinking, what is the appropriate expression for Renaissance-minded people who want to build a country house, a city house? And they began to say, well, what about the Colosseum that gives us stacked orders, that gives us a way to articulate the parts? But what about a country house? What do you do? And so this is the first project that may have been collaborative with Trissino. Here's Mr. Trissino. And here we can begin to see the terra firma. All this darkish green stuff is Veneto, and Venice is just floating off here. The house for Trissino, you might say, doesn't look as though he's, he's nailed it yet <laughs> when it comes to the question of how do you make, what does this thing look like? What does this country house look like? Because in many ways, it looks like a little fortified house with towers at the corner. We have a little bit of a classical loggia going on here with the round-headed arches. But the external expression is not really coming into its own and, and becoming so definitive as a style that we can begin to associate it as something new. Palladio plans become, I think, really interesting. And this is, again, Palladio's drawing. But what we see next to it is a page from the Wittkauer book that you guys are reading, which looks at the Palladio plans and begins to say, there's a method to this. This is not simply the accretion of variations, but there is a kind of rational way of moving through the permutations of what this could be and figuring something out. Jared, yes? Stand up. Look at his shirt. How would you describe his shirt? His shirt is basically plaid, right? <laughs> and beautiful plaid also. I just am so pleased that your, your shirt is so nice. Actually, no. I wanted you to see plaid or tartan plaid. Because what Wittkauer identifies when he begins to look at all of these Palladian villas is that the basic substructure that can be understood to motivate all these variations is the notion of a grid. But not just a neutral grid, but a tartan grid. And by tartan grid, what he means is that the cells of the grid aren't equal, but they're in varied bays. 
Big Bay, Little Bay, Big Bay, Little Bay, Big Bay. And what that begins to give you is not simply a module like Brunelleschi would have where he had same, 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 but you have the possibility of recombining these cells in different ways to get different proportional systems and different kinds of rooms. And so here Wittkauer begins to just run through a number of the villas by Palladio and see ways that the system of Big Bay, Little Bay becomes useful. Frequently in the Little Bay, and let's call Little Bay interstitial space. And interstitial just means in between. So interst interstitial space is the space in between things. Major room, major room, interstitial space. And in the interstitial space, Palladio tends to do things like throw service spaces. Here's a stair, here's a stair. Or sometimes Palladio will say, I'm going to take part of the interstitial space and absorb it into the figure of a major space. So that's how in the Villa Malcontenta, for example, we get a cruciform space. It's a good strategy because what the idea of Little Bay or interstitial space allows him to do is multiple. One, he can vary the proportions without having to reinvent the system every time. And two, he can accommodate things that are messy, like stairways or little uh, closets and storage spaces without biting into the clarity of the, of the major spaces that he's made a big effort to proportion in an ideal way. So here is what we get after a little bit more study from Mr. Palladio, the Villa Goldi in Lonedo. And you have to say, ugh, Palladio, my god. Because it's still not good, right? I mean, it's nice. I like it a lot. It's really severe. And I think Palladio is being decorous, because what do you do? We know from, from Vitruvius, we know from Alberti, we know from Palladio's treatise that you cannot treat a country house as though it were a city house. You have to use different materials, you have to use a different way of articulating it. So still to a large extent, it's a farmhouse with a loggia rammed in it. And here the towers, which were so expressive and so, let's say, medievalizing in the Villa Tricino, become subsumed into the body of the building. So the geometry is clearer. He's getting modern. He's, he's getting with it. And eventually, Palladio gets this great idea in around the 1550s that, in fact, the, the country house, the villa, could become a composite of multiple types. One type could be the farmhouse, which is what he'd been using in his earliest villas, but the other type could be the temple. So this is the Villa Amo, and you can see from the Villa Amo this superposition of temple and farmhouse. By the way, down here we have the client, uh, Amo, Mr. Amo, by Bellini, kind of great portrait of really grumpy looking guy. Here's the plan of the Villa Amo. It's this really tough representation of the Wittkauer diagram of the big bay, little bay, big bay, little bay, big bay, although squashed together. And you have this idea of a temple running all the way through the big bay as though a temple has been slid through the building. Fabulous. And you might want to say, how dare he use a temple? Is he some kind of pagan savage? Is he some kind of worshiper of Zeus? And no, he's not. But he's not obsessing about exactly what the language is. I think in the days of Alberti, in the days of Brunelleschi, the question about temple was much, much more challenged. But by this point, he's, he's using the temple, making it a facade element, and thinking about this notion of the superposition of the farmhouse and the temple as something that begins to govern pretty much the rest of his villas from that point forward. Notice here, we have all of these ancillary buildings. And here's where you keep the chickens and the goats and the uh, grain and the you know, apples and all the harvest. This is a working farm. And here in the center, you have the farmhouse. So it's fabulous. And the interiors of all these Palladian villas are, are richly painted and richly elaborated on the inside. Many years ago, and let me say, when computers could barely type, I had a student who made a program based on this hot new video game that was out called Miss Pac-Man. It was brand new, such a good video game. So if you could incorporate something that cutting edge into what you were doing in your architecture class, that would be great. And the, and the project was little Miss Pac-Man would march through the Palladian villas, and every time she hit a room, she would make a, a sound. And the sound would be the relation, the chord that you got from height to width to length, 
so three notes would be played. And then when you went through a threshold, you got a chord that was two notes being played, the ratio of this thing to this thing, and you could march around the Palladian Villas making music. Isn't that a good project? I have a floppy disk with that on it, but I cannot play my floppy disk anymore. But if you look at the Palladio plans, and maybe this one's not clear enough to see it, you'll see that he's very, very attentive to write numbers inside each room. And these represent the, these harmonic proportions that he's put as, as part of the generative idea of his scheme. Here's another one, the Villa Bador, a more <coughs> elaborated variation on the theme, and again, another kind of working farmhouse with these colonnades coming out and beginning to claim a landscape with a villa popping behind. Palladio's most famous villa, of course, is the Villa Rotonda. And it's probably his most um, eccentric villa, because we've noticed that the other ones are pretty emphatic about what's the front and what's the back. And what's distinctive about the Villa Rotonda is that it's not so picky. <laughs> and when I say not so picky, I mean it really sets off these ideal porches in in both directions, in, in four directions, in all the cardinal directions. It, it has as its basic diagram perfect geometrical forms. The perfection of the square, the perfection of the circle, the perfection of the circle inside the square. Here you can see a couple of things. One really likes the idea of those temple fronts and is running with them again. And also that this thing is not what you think it is. You probably want to correct it in your brain to be a perfect nine square grid with a circle in the center, but there tends to be a kind of directionality to it. So that here we see one of those temples completely dragged through the building, and on these edges we see facades that have been clipped on. So it's a little bit different. Notice also the detail of what happens when the temple front meets the farmhouse building. Palladio has a very, very specific way of doing this, and it's not just taking his cue from temple, but really thinking about what is the interaction between these two conditions of the farmhouse and the temple? And so a piece of wall drags out with it. So instead of simply having the fully plastic, liberated, three-dimensional temple front that you might have on a temple, like the Maison Carré or the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, a piece of wall, a piece of the building comes with it. Fabulous. This is a plan, a site plan, showing you a couple of things. And I think one thing is, Although you have these four equal porch porches uh, engaging the cardinal directions, they really have different landscapes. They really have different qualities. In part, north is north, south is south, east is east, and, e and west is west, and you're going to get different kinds of sunlight and different kinds of views from each of those directions. But also, you have different conditions of containment. Like when you approach the house, you're coming through this sunken road, and you really only get the portico and the dome as your first things that you see. And it's not until about here that your purview expands. From this side, you see this wide landscape with this house crowning it. From here, you have this little carved secret garden almost. And from here, you're looking into agricultural fields. So it, it seems as though, gee, wouldn't one porch be enough? Wouldn't that be better? He's, he's gaining a lot in terms of different ways that the landscape can be appreciated by running it through these different iterations. Magnificent. Here, this is the approach road, where you see this very contracted view of it. And this is the view from the far side, where you see this thing surmounting the hill, as though the hill itself terminates in this perfect Palladian villa. This diagram shows you that every little thing in the villa is organized by strongly controlled geometries. The, the, the Villa Rotunda, as it's built, does not represent the same geometrical principles that the Villa Rotunda as drawn represents, because Palladio died before it was completely executed, and a different kind of dome was built on it. So, too bad Palladio. Another villa by Palladio that's frequently cited as spectacular is the Villa Malcontenta. And this one is just on the outskirts of Venice, on the Brenta Canal. And it's a, it's a different condition, because instead of facing farmland, this one faces a canal. This is really much more of a Venetian building because of the fact that its main address is to the water and not to land. And in part because of that, it opens up. Its portico uh, doesn't have that little piece of wall sliding through, but instead the stairs wrap through it and fold through it and begin to allow you to enter the building regardless of how high the water is. Because you have to realize that these canals vary in height. If you get a bad weather pattern, 
the winds will blow in a certain direction and, and Venice and the whole canal system associated with Venice will back up like a bad toilet. This is called aqua alta and it can often be the case that you, well if you lived in Venice you would have rubber boots and you would wear them at least 50 days a year because you would need them to get through the water. But it's solved here because the door is not down here, the door is up here and if the water floods you just get on a different stair and up you go. Here's the plan. Beautiful plan. Very much what Wittkauer would expect us to see. Big bay, little bay, big bay, little bay. But with this interesting transformation of finding a figure within this neutral bay system, and the figure is cruciform. A cruciform figure is two barrel vaults intersecting. And all of these rooms have these sort of really wonderful sculpted ceilings, barrel vaults, domes, and so forth. And this is a plan where I think you can see quite clearly how Palladio inscribes the geometrical system onto the plan itself. So this building really has two faces. One face faces the water and it really looks spe spectacular. And by spectacular I mean fully plastic. This temple pulling out, becoming a object behind which we read the block of the villa. We can also see hovering above it is another little temple which is coming out of the upper story. Now when you go to the back facade, which is the garden facade over here, a very different condition takes place. You can see that there's this kind of little gesture, this little bump in the wall that acknowledges the notion of temple dragging through the farmhouse and begins to show you that something is there but not much because most of what it is there has been pulled forward and expressed with all this plasticity on the canal facade. So this is what you get on the back facade and it's kind of amazing. I mean, Palladio is being a good archaeologist, you might say. And by good archaeologist, I mean he knows that Rome is full of stuff. Rome doesn't just have temples. Rome's got all kinds of things. Rome has thermal baths, for example. And this kind of window is called a thermal window. This is the kind of window that would have brought light into the vaults of, of, of a Roman bath. The thermal window that he has over here brings light into the cruciform barrel vault or cross vault that he has over his main hall. There's a nice contrast between the flatness or the um, suppression of the figure onto the surface in this facade and the expression of it on the other facade. You read them as the same thing but variations on a theme. It could even be suggested that it's as though something's been cut off and you just see the cavity that represents the loss of the figure. To make that really attractive to you, this is the Bohemian astronomer Tycho Brahe, who had his nose cut off in a sword fight and therefore strapped a wooden nose onto his face so that he would look more attractive. I'm suggesting that maybe this is what you would see if you got a front view of him. Don't know. Palladio is, is looking at archaeological examples that broaden, broaden the range of things that he can do. He's not just looking at the canon, he's going beyond the canon. So this is a little temple of Clitumnus in Spoleto, a little town to the north of Rome, where the stairs slide in through the side. And he's kind of picking up on those models for his method of, of organizing this. Another one of his most magnificent villas is the Villa Barbaro in the town of Maser. And this is another one of these great humanists that he's working for, Daniele Barbaro, who wrote his own uh, commentary on Leo. So this is not a neutral client. And this is highly elaborated in terms of the villa and the support buildings. The villa becomes almost a minor player in, in the degree to which the support buildings have been amplified and expressed. These are little dovecots that you have over here on the far side, one of which has a sundial. So it really looks like nice, you know, A, B, C, B, A, rhythm of these things with the dovecots, variations on the theme of temple. It's sad, like about eight years ago, the people that lived in the Villa Maser, the Villa Barbaro in Maser, had 500 dogs. And that was fun. I, I'm going to have to scan <coughs> old slides of the Villa Maser because there were so many dogs here that the dogs would sleep on top of the bushes to get away from the other dogs. They were just everywhere. And the last time I went, I asked the woman who was selling tickets, you know, where are the dogs? What happened to all the dogs? And she said, dead, all dead. <laughs> so no more dogs. The dogs are still there in the painting because 
this is an example of kind of really, really great painting on the interior here. Uh, and, and it's full of dogs and it's full of all these kinds of trompe l'oeil perspectives, extensions of the, of the space that you're actually in into the pictorial space of the house. We'll continue talking more about Palladio and his villas next time. And we'll talk about Palladio in terms of how he makes an impact on, on contemporary practice also.